Hey everyone, um, I'm assuming you guys are coming back. Uh, you guys have already watched the overview on gadgets and ha at least have a basic understanding about you know, how to get a gadget up on iGoogle and how to test it and how to start developing on it. So um, now that you guys already know that, um, here's you know, uh, a chance to like, learn a little bit more about, in depth about some of our, our, our core features on gadgets that people are using um, that will really uh, help you build some, some really more useful gadgets out there. So starting off, um, I guess one of the more important ones uh, that we'd like to talk about is storing data into your user press. Um, so in the overview uh, video, we mentioned uh, being able to store data and make it persistent across reloads um, on iGoogle. And so and if you look at this XML, um, I've actually highlighted and bolded the lines that are actually really important to you in order to make this work. So um, we actually call this a set press library um, because uh, you're technically writing data back to a user pref. So one of the first things that you need to do is just put in, put in this uh, require feature equals set prefs tag as a child element under module prefs. And in addition to that, you want to create sort of a placeholder user pref where that data is going to be saved. So that's essentially what the, um, the text user pref is. It's giving a default value of you know, type text here, and it gives it a data type of hidden, which means that you know when your gadget gets rendered on Google, um, uh, the users are not going to see this user pref anywhere. Uh, it's not going to be visible to them. So, um, the third bolded statement down at the very bottom, which is some JavaScript, is basically just a call. It's using uh, our prefs library. Um, it, you see, you know, one one statement above that there's a you know uh, initializer. And it's, it's calling a constructor for ig underscore prefs. Um, and using that, there's actually a set method which you pass in in the first parameter the user pref name, and then in the second parameter you pass in the value that you want to save. So once you do that, it's pretty simple as that. Um, this will shoot out a request back to our servers and send that data and store it. Uh, the next uh, feature that I'm going to talk about is probably the most powerful feature of gadgets, which makes it useful. Um, and this is uh, fetching remote content and displaying it inside of your gadget. So this is truly useful within, uh, within gadgets because it, it really makes your gadget uh, a lot more dynamic in terms of its content. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, uh, there's, you know, we're in a world where RSS and Atom feeds are, are just, just about everywhere now. And, you know, how to keep your content fresh within your gadget, you know, what's the answer to that? Well, the answer is to, you know, bring in an RSS feed and, and you know, let, let the publisher of that feed, you know, be the one that sort of, Controls the you know the updating of your content, and so your gadget will dynamically you know always update itself, and this becomes truly useful when you're you know creating things like news feeds, or you know there can be like blog feeds as well, etc. So um, fetching remote content is extremely easy and convenient. Um, it's fast, and we we also cache um, the responses coming back from this stuff, so um, you don't have to worry about you know let's say like. CNN.com, you know, you're requesting millions and millions of feeds per day from them. Like, since we cache those requests you know, approximately once every hour or so, um, they'll also, it'll also eliminate a lot of the bandwidth um, problems that, that they'll see. So if you look in the slides, um, there's actually three core methods that are available to you uh, in the Gadgets API. And the first one is uh, fetch feed as JSON. And then there's fetch, fetch XML content. And then the last one is fetch content. And they're all different in slightly different ways. Um, just primarily based on the, the return object, that's, um, the return response that's coming back to you. So the fetch feed as JSON um, basically has the ability to fetch any atom or, or, or RSS feeds. And you can specify the number of entries that you want to retrieve along with a Boolean value at the end, which is the summaries parameter. It can be true or false. Um, and depending on that value, it'll bring in some more descriptions from the RSS or atom feed as well. And this is going to actually, you know, based on the callback, it's going to actually call return to you in your callback function uh, a JSON object, which is going to be very easy to, to just iterate through, iterate through your entries because it, it comes back in a nicely formatted object as an array. And you can just easily go through that and, and just generate some HTML and, and output that into your, into your DOM. So the next, the next method is fetch XML content. And this has the capability of fetching any XML uh, feed out there, so it doesn't have to be Atom or it doesn't have to be RSS. It could be your own custom XML. Um, and the benefit of this is that a lot of times, even in RSS feeds, you know, you actually want to, you know, it actually returns, a, it actually contains a lot more data within, the, within that feed than than is being parsed out from the the initial, the first method, the fetch feed as JSON one. So sometimes, let's say you want to get images, 
um, or there's other like hidden tags there that you want to get you know get access to. The fetch XML content comes in really used, comes in um, you know it's it's very useful there where you can um, it just returns back an XML object, and you can just iterate through all the nodes yourself um, and pull out all the data that you need. So the last method is um, is just straight text. You know it just returns back. Um, raw text back to your callback function, and this one is generally not as as popular or is not as useful in many ways. But you know, I have seen services, I have seen gadgets where you know they've relied and, and they've called, um, they've requested data from services that don't publish any like XML stand, like feeds or anything like that. And what they end up doing is they they would request you know this this static this HTML page you know from this site, and it'll actually scrape through the HTML looking for specific values and, and just extract some specific data. It's not you know, the most ideal way to, to bring in remote content, but it's definitely one of the ways that people do it. So here's a really quick example. Um, uh, it actually shows some, it's just basically the uh, HTML code and JavaScript that you would have inside of your gadget. Uh, so here's an example of uh, how to actually fetch a, a simple Atom and RSS feed. Um, and this is just a really quick code snippet. If you want to actually have or find out more details about it, you can always check out um, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of code snippets in our documentation, or we also have another video um, that's going to show a little more in depth on how to, you know, parse an, uh, an Atom or RSS feed and bring it into your gadget. So, uh, this is just one of the very useful things um, that people are doing in their gadgets: is bringing in news feeds and blog feeds and etc. So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, is content type, um, and this this is a um, this is more of a preference, I think, uh, on how you want to build your gadget. Um, the majority of gadgets, I will say, are using type equals HTML. Um, and there's another type called type equals URL. And the difference is that uh, with type equals HTML, um, your gadget will actually render, it'll be rendered by, it'll be rendered on gmodules.com, which is basically points to our servers, which renders the, the it parses the XML and it'll render the HTML that you specify within the XML tag. And all the HTML that is going to go within the XML, within the gadget XML itself. With type equals URL, uh, you actually just put in an href attribute, which points to a URL that contains some server-side page or dynamic page that you're generating, such as like a PHP page or a Perl page. Um, and this is actually going to generate the HTML for you. So this is beneficial more for people that are uh, that are more used to doing more like server-side development, uh, that, are, that sort of, for some reason, want to use server-side scripts. Um, f authentication is one of the reasons. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to do in gadgets in general. And so a lot of the times what we're telling developers to do is to create a type equals URL gadget that points to some back-end you know, PHP script, which you know, does the, handles the authentication themselves. Um, the other difference here is also that type URL gadgets are actually going to be rendered based, are, are actually going to just render uh, directly off of the domain where your your server script is hosted. This slide just highlights some of uh, the various API features that we have. It's definitely not including all of the ones that we have currently have in our documentation, but it's it highlights some of the ones that are, are tend to be more popular. Uh, for example, we have the tabs library, we have the flash library, uh, which makes it easy to embed flash. Uh, dynamic height allows you to um, have your gadget automatically resize itself to fit uh, the content, and this is important on, on iGoogle when real estate is actually a really um, important concern for users. When you have about 20, 30 gadgets on your page, you don't want a gadget that has uh, that is wasting any kind of space for you. So, the mini message library uh, provides a really quick way for you to add just really quick status messages. Uh, maybe promotion messages like if you upgrade your gadget to a different version, or you want people to see some some something else. You know, many messages can create you know really simply these tiny little yellow status messages um, for users, which are you know, which they can also you know dismiss by clicking on the X and, and get rid of it if they if they don't want it there anymore. So um, the few other ones that I list there, like some of you, some of them I've talked about previously, which is a set press, which is to store data back into your user press. Uh, we have an analytics library, which makes it easy for you to track um, your gadget, some of the gadget stats, like page views and maybe interactions, and have that re you know reported back to your analytics account. The grid drag libraries are there if you want to implement any kind of dragging, uh, drag dropping, uh, user UI type stuff in your gadget. Okay, so here's the full list. Um, basically, you know, adding new features to your gadget or using, you know, to use uh, one of those specific API libraries is as simple as adding 
any one of these require feature equals you know library name tags. So here's just a really quick snapshot of, of what that might look like. Going a little more in depth into um, into the tabs library, this is also one of our most popular libraries. I would say um, it's important because, or it's really useful because it really allows you to pack in a lot more information into that small amount of space in your gadget um, by creating separate tabs for for things. And as you can see here, it's just you know it's just a little bit of snippet of JavaScript that that's required to add you know a bunch of tabs. And, and we we have a wrapper library that that makes it very easy to do this. Uh, the next feature I was talking about is the Flash API library and um, it's another just JavaScript method that you can use to embed uh, your Swift objects, your Flash compiled Swift files. Um, Swift files are known to be so many different ways to, to embed them with different types of HTML and depending on how you do it, you know, it'll work in some browsers, it might not work in others. So uh, we just created this convenience method for you guys to be able to embed any Swift file into your um, into your gadget and have it cross browser compatible, and it's just a single line of JavaScript. The mini message library, as I pointed out earlier, is uh, a way to, you know, give some status notifications um, to your users. Um, they're really small. They're really lightweight. You know, they're very like I, just like a flash library. They're just one line of JavaScript. Um, users can easily dismiss them. It comes packaged with the with the little X, you know, delete icon on the right. And you can configure them using various types of CSS as well. So um, if you need to alert users of anything, of, of a new version or something like that, or there's like some promotion going on, uh, mini messages are probably the easiest way to do it. The Dyna dynamic height library is, uh, is also very important. It conserves space for your users on, on, on their iGoogle homepage. Um, and it's also just a single call JavaScript method. Um, you can also pass in an optional uh, a number um, as a parameter and basically telling your gadget to resize to this specific height. So uh, with this with this method, you know, it gives you a little bit more control over or how big, you know, how how high your gadget will, will render. Um, most cases or not, you really want it to just fit around the content that you display. And uh, the reason why we have a method like this is because all gadgets are actually rendered on on iframes, and so um, it actually requires some 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 tricky protocols to. Uh, to have the parent container, you know, resize the child iframe that your gadget's basically rendering in. So, so that pretty much wraps up uh, this video. Um, I highlighted a few of our most important features um, uh, that people are using in the gadgets today. Um, and it's definitely not, you know, ex including all of the ones that we have. So please um, check out our documentation and, and check out the full list of features and because there might be other libraries that are more useful to you than the ones that I mentioned here. So um, also if, um, definitely check out some of the other videos uh, which will actually go into a little bit more detail about um, some of the features I talked about here such as like fetching remote content and dynamic height. Um, you can actually view and, and see some of the source code and he'll talk about it there uh, as well. So. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, see you guys again soon.